Welcome everybody to the science kickoff. The Arctic Frontiers plenary program is now over and we will take with us new knowledge and inspiration but also challenges and thankfully some solutions on all matters Arctic from both the political, policy and the business and scientific perspective. We are concluding the plenary program with this science kickoff session. And we're going to feature the four themes of the Arctic Frontiers science program, which we all will participate in over the next two days. The Arctic Frontiers science is both international and interdisciplinary, and there will be strong contributions in both oral and poster presentations. There is a lot of exciting research and a lot of exciting science to choose from. And what I noticed is there's a lot of overlapping teams and overlapping sessions, and sometimes I wish I could split into various people to not just see good friends and colleagues give a talk and support them, but also to go to new sessions and learn and get inspired. Um, so to give you some help, over the next 40 to 45 minutes, we will try to provide you with a little oral science guide. And we have asked members of the science committees and specialists to dig into each scientific theme to provide us with a brief outlook, giving us their opinions and their statements, perhaps some highlights of the issues relevant to each theme. And um, I just want to say my name is Kiki Kleiven. I'm an associate professor in marine geology at the University of Bergen and the Bjorkness Center for Climate. And I have the honor of moderating this very exciting group. And so with me today, I have representing theme number one, Arctic food security. I have Dr. Tracy Galloway. Tracy is an assistant professor at the Department of Anthropology at University of Toronto. She's a community health scholar whose research addresses the health priorities of circumpolar indigenous people. And you have a long track record of respectful engagement and successful collaboration with northern communities and organizations. For team two, knowledge-based development in the Arctic, I have Ms. Gorsha Smizek. She's a researcher at the Arctic Center, the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Lapland in Rovaniemi. And in your research, you study both international environment regimes, Arctic governance question of science policy interface, science diplomacy, and also gender environment nexus. Um, it is important to note that you are the co-founder and co-lead of a non-profit association, Women of the Arctic, making it in the Arctic. For team two, three, sorry, disruptive technologists, we have Dr. Hans Kleivdahl. You're the executive president for Environment at North, the Norwegian Research Center, where you are responsible for the marine environmental research, sustainable aquaculture, industrial biotechnology, and the circular economy. You're also an adjunct associate professor in marine biotechnology at the University of Bergen. And your research background is molecular biology on antibiotic resistance and cancer research. And professionally, you have a background that from both academic research and over 10 years in biotech industry, within life sciences, product R&D, biotechnology, and also development of new value change. For team four, local or global Arctic, multi-scale considerations of connections and remoteness in climate impacted communities. We have Dr. Dr. Ingrid uh, Agnete Medby, originally from Northern Norway, but now you're in uh, a lecturer, senior lecturer in political geography at the Department of Social Sciences at Oxford Brookes University. And your doctoral research project looked among many things, that ideas of Arctic identity in Norway, Iceland, and Canada. And right now, your research and research project are focusing on the Arctic geopolitics and identity. For instance, uh, focusing on the Barons Corporation. So we're going to start uh, hearing a little bit from Team One, Tracy. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kiki. I'd just like to acknowledge my co-organizer of this theme, Marianne K uh, Kjellvold, who's not able to be with us uh, this week. Um, and I'm speaking from the Canadian context uh, because that's the context with which I'm the most informed. And it's the context that gives me my passion about addressing food security in the Arctic. Uh, in May of 2012, the International Circumpolar Council um, 
published a report called Food Security Across the Arctic, and uh, they described the issues affecting uh, food security rates in circumpolar communities, and those centered around the high, high cost of food, the economic vulnerability of people living in Arctic communities, um, decreasing consumption of traditional foods with a recognition of how valuable those are for the nutrition and um, identities of people who live in the north, uh, contaminants in the food chain, and climate change. And I will say those issues continue to be the primary drivers uh, of food insecurity in the Canadian Arctic. And our latest data has not changed since we started measuring food security in Canadian circumpolar communities in 2004. Over half of households uh, report being food insecure every week. And that number is 7 in 10 for households where there are children. Okay. So our call for um, papers on food security brought together scholars from circumpolar regions whose work examines the impacts of marine and terrestrial food sources on the food security of people living in Arctic communities and across the globe. Um, we recognize that as communities face climate and socially mediated constraints on their capacity for self-sufficiency, um, that it's innovative and resourceful approaches, many of them rooted in the indigenous cultures and traditions of that region region that are emerging to solve the crisis of food insecurity. Papers in our sessions can be loosely grouped into the themes that reflect those highlighted in the 2012 report. So novel approaches to community self-sufficiency and sustainability through programs that draw on indigenous practices, harvest, sharing of food, preparing of country foods, and the sharing and transmission of the knowledge about those foods between generations and across communities and regions. Uh, we have papers uh, that have reflections from approaches to food security that are used in Arctic uh, contexts such as Sami communities, Chakota communities, and we have a really exciting presentation about some innovative work being done across Nunavut in Canada. Okay. Um, we have new, and use, new uses and potential adaptations of Arctic marine and terrestrial biodiversity to solve local and global challenges of food security. And examples are um, a number of studies from coastal Norway on farmed and wild caught fish, um, new value chains that center on low trophic aquaculture, and interesting uh, new innovations and applications of uh, brown seaweed and sugar kelp. Okay. Our papers uh, document the increasing concern over the persistence of microplastics in the marine food chain and the interactions of these microplastics with organic pollutants with real and lasting effects for uh, human health and biodiversity. And then what, as a social scientist, I'm very excited about the papers we have that center on policy implications, um, both locally and at scale. And they answer questions like, how do we support indigenous communities to design and implement their own food security strategies? And what's the ideal form of allyship? This is a term we use in the North American context. Uh, how can we best be allies for this work as non-indigenous scholars and uh, people who work in government and other organizations in this moment of global reconciliation with indigenous communities? What larger scale systems are necessary and how can we bring new technologies such as environmental surveillance monitoring and climate impact monitoring to bear on the challenge of food security in ways that don't replicate past exploitations or harms? Okay. Uh, we want these technologies to move us to a new space where the value of Arctic regions uh, is recognized to be the strength and resilience of the communities that have lived there for millennia. Remember, it's not a frontier, it is occupied. Right. And uh, Kiki asked me uh, at the end of the talk to highlight what I think is cutting edge about some of the content of our sessions. And I'm going to give you a very typical social scientist answer. Remember, my discipline is anthropology. Um, I interpret cutting edge to mean novel. And what would be novel is if we did what we said we would do, that we recognize the self-determination of indigenous peoples that is uh, entrenched in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, which is something that uh, all the countries participate participating here are signatories too, and we exercise that legislatively with acts, regulation, policy, and treasury board movement that put the money and the control in the hands of the people that can determine their own futures. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Gosia, what can we expect from team two? Fabulous things. <laughs> <laughs>
because first of all is, of course, well, the theme of this year's conference is the power of knowledge, and the theme too is knowledge-based development in the Arctic. And um, it is my pleasure here to speak on the whole committee that was working on preparing this session, because one thing is that, of course, well, we keep on talking about science policy interface, knowledge-based development, but actually, well, the question is where the rubber hits the road. So how do we actually do that? How do we, do, how do we put it in practice? How do we put it in communities? What are the lessons that we can learn from the, from the project? So I think it's, um, it was really terrific to see organizers putting this team front and center um, of the science conference because it's really, and we saw from the numbers, from the high numbers of abstract, the multitude of issues related to knowledge-based development. Um, so um, just to give you a brief overview, because it's really impossible just to cover in three minutes now all presentations that will be there. Uh, but tomorrow we'll begin with, once again, with the issue of critical importance. And once again, repeat it often, but it's open question, how do we do it in practice? And this is indigenous and community-based knowledge. Um, so we are going to hear, among others, for instance, about the um, run by the community, the monitoring program of the health of ringed seals, among others, but also, for instance, about the participation participation of indigenous peoples in the, West, um, in the wetland restoration and conservation of those. What is really fascinating, um, I would like to highlight here also that scientists will be speaking about the training opportunities that those programs they run, they provide for communities. Um, and from there right away into session two, we'll zoom out completely because another thing that clearly came from all the abstracts we've seen is a question of Arctic data. And not only that, because we'll hear more about this, I suppose, in technologies, but also how we can actually map users' needs when it comes to this data. Because that's a critical question. Um, and it is, um, and we are fortunate here to hear about number of projects that are mapping needs of stakeholders and how we could match the two together. But of course, it's just, um, so this will be the first two teams. Um, from this stage, over these last two days, we've heard also a lot about the role of science in international collaboration and in the peaceful relations that we are experiencing in the region. So it's also good to understand if tensions are rising, however the situation is changing, how it worked in practice, so this notion of science diplomacy, that I think many of us oftentimes, uh, well, we use it, but the question is, what do we mean? mean by that and how we can advance that is always open. Um, so there will be also researchers presenting their, their work on those topics. <coughs> Co-production of knowledge is, is another theme and we've heard uh, about it from this stage. Um, what, uh, what we find particularly interesting is also um, how many presentations or ideas we've heard, uh, particularly when it comes to involvement of business community, where of course there is a question of production of um, data, ownership, and so on, but also their participations in the project. Um, we'll hear examples from Oulu region, from Finland, and, and others. Team or session number um, six um, is also a question from local to international levels of knowledge and decision making. And I think that's, um, that's another area that is particularly fascinating because often it's a question, how do we take those insights from the ground if we actually need to address them at the global level? And here, for instance, one of the interesting presentations will, be in, uh, will concern ocean acidification and ideas of uncertainty around that. And finally, uh, to conclude, uh, we will have the session on knowledge for many Arctics, um, because that's, an, uh, that's another thing, what you, what you said, Tracy. Coming from Canadian context, it might look different in different parts of the region. But here, what we'll be stressing, and this is, and I think it's, it's great to end um, this, uh, this theme of the conference, is the, is the question of education, and education for self-determination of sustainable development in the Arctic. So he, we'll hear about it as well, um, and I think we can address more in questions. Thank, Thank you. you, Lucia. And what can we expect from uh, session four? I was give you a good applause for that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What a session should we have to offer us? Well, uh, disruptive technologies. Um, so we'll be looking at technologies that have the power to, uh, to change the way we think, the way we operate, uh, and uh, perform and collaborate in the Arctic. But it's not only about um, new, a new technology that can perform a, a, or solve a solution faster and cheaper. It's about the use of technologies to change whole systems, system innovations.
Um, and as we've heard uh, over the last uh, days, uh, the Arctic is really the canary in the coal mine when it comes to climate change. So it's it's crucial to fully monitor the baselines of the uh, of the ocean, the climate, the environment, the ecology, the biodiversity very closely uh, to uh, achieve the goal of a fully integrated uh, ocean monitoring system that the State Secretary mentioned this morning. But also the increasing, increasing uh, commercial activity in the Arctic, of course, should be monitored to ensure a safe and uh, responsible operations. Now, to achieve this, um, stakeholders need to access data from the environment as close as real time as possible, um, have the data collected, analyzed, processed in various manners and presented to decision makers, uh, while the entire process is integrated and uh, digitized. So the tech sessions will mainly cover uh, five technology elements, where um, sensor and measurement technology of, is of course fundamental to all observation and, and data collection. And over the coming days, we'll see uh, several presentations of remote optical sensors from high altitudes uh, that can monitor everything from oil spills to algae blooms and, uh, and sea ice. We'll see multi-sensory technologies and also in situ sensing of uh, DNA techniques to uh, monitor by biodiversity patterns over space and time. So it's a quite wide uh, range there. Uh, now all these sensors need uh, um, autonomous mobile platforms to uh, ensure that the sensors uh, indeed measure what they should be monitoring uh, in the area of interest. And uh, several speakers will cover the uh, advances in, in placing sensors on satellites, drones, um, uh, gliders, and even aircrafts uh, while challenged by the Arctic climate and especially the icing uh, issues. Then there's the, the critical element of um, communication and collecting the data from the point of measurement in rem remote areas. And of course, there is no Wi-Fi out there. So, uh, and telecommunication is limited because of uh, the, it's north of the 80 degree latitude. But we'll hear more uh, in the sessions uh, about the currently increasing number of uh, satellite initiatives, such as the Copernicus program of the ESA, and also the low orbit communication satellite that will be more and more important uh, in the years to come. So the terms uh, new space uh, is used for these smaller and, and cheaper uh, satellites from commercial actors and will most probably revolutionize the telecommunications in, uh, in the coming years. So many of our speakers on, on Thursday will elaborate on the satellite connectivity and uh, networking uh, technology initiatives in, in, in this field. Now, with the increasing uh, number of free and open data available, the next challenge is, of course, to manage and interpret these data in an integrated system. Uh, this opens for real-time or close to real-time um, uh, observations and will greatly, greatly improve the, the responsive um, and informed decision-making uh, making in, in, in stakeholders of the Arctic. But it also allows for uh, numeric models for prediction and forecasting the environmental or metocean development, uh, or to support, for instance, risk assessment when it comes to maritime operations. So some of our speakers on Thursday will present their work on, on using artificial intelligence and machine learning to get more information from the collected uh, data in that sense. So overall, these enabling technologies um, holds the promise of achieving a, a higher level of collected uh, knowledge. So the power of knowledge um, enabled and boosted by the, by the technologies uh, advancements and um, integrating several layers of information to get a deeper and more holistic understanding of the complex environmental and climatic uh, changes and the boundaries that we are limited by in the Arctic. Um, the, the, the questions are how, how will the data sharing um, really work? Uh, and, uh, and what about the, income, um, the different uh, data in different formats from different uh, providers? Uh, but uh, I encourage you all to come to the sessions and uh, get a tech update. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. And last but not least, session four, Ingrid.
Yeah, <clears throat> so session four is, is called Local or Global Arctic, Multiscalar Considerations of Connections and Remoteness in Climate Impacted Communities. So I think this, I can already see a lot of connections between the sessions. Um, we are also very interested in, uh, as Gosha mentioned, the challenges of scaling up or scaling down, going mm -hmm. between the local and the global. How do we take local experiences and perhaps scale it up to that international level, but also vice versa? How does the kind of work that, for example, the Arctic Council does, how does that work in, in practice in the more kind of local contexts and so on? Um, so the, the, the main themes of, the, of this particular uh, science theme is the uh, societal, political, uh, scientific challenges and transformations from climate change. So we've heard a lot about climate change in the last couple of days, and, uh, and that's what we're going to be exploring further in this in these science papers. So we're bringing together experts of, on Arctic climate change with experts on um, adaptations, on the political and the, and the social, cultural, environmental, and so on, transformations that are, are changing the Arctic region. Uh, and as mentioned, we're interested in questions of scale. So that means spatial scales, so national, international, local, and so on, but also temporal scales. How do we work in perhaps short time frames, and when do we need those longer time frames to, um, to assess the kinds of things that we um, need, or the kinds of knowledge that we need for policy making, for decision making, and so on. Um, how do these different scales work together? Um, as well as how do we work across this and I think this is something that I'm sure we're going to discuss further because I think that is a key challenge to all of us as, as scientists is working across those disciplinary boundaries. Um, what are the opportunities when we do that as well as what are the challenges in terms of the languages that we speak, the, the methods that we perhaps use. So I'm really excited that this theme is bringing together very different methods. So we have um, more traditional kind of discourse course analyses, we have remote sensing, we have modeling, and we have storytelling and visual analyses as well. And I think there is real value to bringing these kinds of papers together and actually speaking to each other to see what can we learn from each and how do they, they um, um, work together. So some of the, the questions that we, that we raised in the initial call for papers centered on uh, what are the key climatic and environmental impacts on Arctic communities? Um, what are the causes behind them and, and how do they manifest in, in different areas across different scales? And what are the interactions with the global? Um, what do we even mean when we talk about the global? How do we conceptualize that? Um, what are some possible and what are some realistic strategies? What are some innovations that we might want to think about? Um, and importantly, how do we bring together science and communities or community concerns? Tomorrow we also have a, a particular focus on the Northern Sea Route. Um, so there, there's going to be a, a panel discussion on the Northern Sea Route and, and impacts on communities, in particular indigenous communities. I think we quite often talk about the Northern Sea Route in terms of quite kind of grand geopolitical issues, how is it going to change power balances and so on. But what we're really interested in, in exploring further is also um, how is it going to impact on people living along the, that Northern Sea, sea Route, um, what are the kind of issues that, that are raised. We have some papers that focus on the national scale, we have some that focus on the urban scale, and some on the interstate and international. So we have, um, in terms of context, it's kind of Sweden, Greenland, Russia, as well as the EU, as well as, as UNCLOS and the Law of the Sea, international law, um, perspectives from Korea, uh, Japan, and so on. So, um, yeah, and finally, I'd also highlight that one of the other topics that comes up under theme four is also science diplomacy. And again, that challenge of, of scale when we talk about science diplomacy. How does science and, and policy and decision making in and for and with the Arctic work in practice? Yeah. Thank you, Ingrid. So several of you have used the word interdisciplinary. So are there other projects within uh, the themes that, that 
particularly demonstrate new interdisciplinary approaches. Well, um, <laughs> uh, last year there was an, uh, an incident of uh, harmful algal blooms in the coast, northern coast of, of, uh, of Norway, and uh, it was devastating for the aquaculture industry. Uh, and I think that, uh, well, that was uh, the crease of Crumbelina, which many decades uh, ago, since that was uh, an issue here, I guess it's an effect of, 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 uh, of the climate change, but um, how this can be tackled with, uh, uh, with the emerging technologies uh, and uh, interdisciplinary approach is that you can have, uh, well, shown here, you have everything from satellites to gliders to, uh, to drones uh, monitoring the, uh, the chlorophyll A, for instance. Um, and you can, you can start with the satellites, then if you see something, you can go down to the, to the high-altitude drones, low-altitude drones, surface drones, and even with the DNA technology and deep uh, ecology understanding, you can uh, you can have a glider that is actually following the the forefront of, of the uh, bloom, mm. and and I think that's uh, that's one way of of pulling together technologies and and interdisciplinary competencies to address uh, one one problem that may uh, become. Uh, more relevant than, than just a single uh, shot. Mm. This emergent, yeah, Kusha. I guess I, do, I just wanted to add here because I think, well, when we were speaking about the notion of interdisciplinary and I was looking at, once again at all the sessions that we'll be having, I was thinking, I'm not sure if there is anyone that is strictly disciplinary because I think it's mm. just like we moved already beyond that. Um, but at the same time, I guess um, when it comes to really like pushing the edge of disciplines, um, I think here I would highlight the session on the question of um, users' needs of Arctic data. Because it's really like the, the projects that will be presented there, well, the sheer notion of starting of the, from the needs of stakeholders and how this can be applied, I think this really, well, it pushes people really outside of their comfort zone, scientists, users, everyone. Um, but here I was even, even thinking one of the presentations that we will hear tomorrow concerns search and rescue activities. So really where, where human lives are at stake and at the same time we're looking at the technology that can help with that. We're using, we're looking at the needs of people who are there in boats, uh, small communities and so forth. So I think there is, there is definitely a lot that, that is pushed there. Um, yeah, so, so definitely hmm. we could look into those. Yeah. And just to build on that, um, I know in the in the food security sessions there'll be some discussion about the relationship between transportation and food security. And here's where some of those novel technologies come into play. Like as we better understand um, weather systems, and uh, you know we're able to monitor with a little more reliability um, and model our transport systems to make them more reliable, more efficient. There is the risk if we aren't working in a, a very broad interdisciplinary and policy policy, you know, related way of just replicating past, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of structures mm -hmm. that are unjust, right? So we'll build new technologies that will serve commercial airline operators or commercial sea lift operators. Whereas if we're working together right from the start and at scale, we can define different end users and build use cases around um, medical transport and community resupply and fuel supply for communities and food uh, that are driven by the people people with the needs. So I think that that's another il illustration of the value of interdisciplinarity. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You're bringing out communication and transport, and, and those are also themes or, or words that we see in all sessions, and Ingrid, you were specifically talking about in your session the communication also between countries as potential a bottleneck for, for achieving some of our science goals. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm a political geographer, but I think when it comes to the Arctic, and perhaps this is true everywhere, it's not so much about geographical distances in, in meters and kilometers and, and latitudes and so on, but quite often it's about connections and infrastructures. So you don't have to be very far from a city or whatever it might be if you don't have the, the roads or the, the transport modes of, of traveling those distances or internet or whatever it might be. Um, so I think, again, in, in the in theme four, 
we're interested in challenging these notions of what it means to be remote, remoteness, and connections. And I think, you know, coming back to the question of, of disciplines as well, we're, we're very lucky to be at a conference like this where we see those connections between different disciplines, different knowledge systems as well, I think are, are really crucially important. Yeah. Mm. And also we, we see that there are also challenges and, 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 and possibilities in knowledge production itself. Um, how could you elaborate a little bit on that based on your team? I mean, we talk about data sharing. That's one, one um, hill that we have to climb. Uh, that's a central role um, for indigenous uh, communities to, to bring their knowledge in, but also uh, bring scientific knowledge in to get that, that very much needed interplay. What are challenges and possibilities? I'm thinking in the last session, uh, we, uh, the, the reindeer herder who's sitting here, uh, he was talking about, we talked a little bit about the possibilities. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on the possibilities. I'm gonna start with you, Tracy, because yeah. a lot of the work that has been, been doing in Arctic Canada it's focusing on empowerment and focusing on yeah. utilizing the possibilities. I mean, it, it, food security is just one example of a sphere in which um, we're beginning to learn, in the Canadian context at least, that those knowledges possessed by indigenous communities have the answers, right? This idea of thinking across borders to solve problems, that's not new, right? Uh, communities, indigenous communities, and it shouldn't be me here speaking about this, there are people with deeper expertise about this, but what made uh, Inuit society, for example, adaptive and resilient is that uh, people helped each other and where things were abundant and rich in one community, they communicated that message and others moved there or the products moved elsewhere. And that happened before there were national boundaries. So that's one way that sharing of knowledge and expertise has happened laterally across boundaries and it has happened temporally. So the fact that these knowledges still exist is uh, almost miraculous when you think of the colonial cultures and structures that we put in place to, uh, to kill them. So uh, these are tremendously adaptable and resilient cultures and, and they really do need to have the control uh, of how those knowledges are produced. And I would say that the word scientific is not a word to put beside traditional or indigenous. There is indigenous science. It is part of those knowledge systems and we just don't yet have a large capacity for understanding that. So there are some um, papers in our session uh, by Northerners with lived experience of the North where people will describe those knowledges and how those systems are passed on to young people and how they have survived uh, uh, over, you know, decades and hundreds of years. So that's, I think, important, you know, to recognize those capacities and make sure that we get out of the way of the survival of these, uh, these knowledges. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to add here because I think when we talk about co-production of knowledge, one notion, and I previously mentioned that, but I think it's uh, to me it illustrates well what the added value of well the added value of co-production of knowledge is. For example, when it comes to notion of uncertainty, how differently this single word is understood by users, by scientists, by researchers who are providing information, by users of this information, by managers, by communities, etc. So um, including business partners in, in all those projects. So I think when we are discussing the question of co-production of knowledge, also possibilities, for instance, well, the clear, well, the added value is just bringing everyone to the same page, starting from understanding where we come from to kind of how we can move forward together. So I think that's, that's also an interesting aspect that I think it comes across many sessions here. Hmm. Yeah, and I, and I think there is increasing emphasis on science and research communication, and that's great. We are always asked to disseminate our research and our findings, but I think there is still some way to go in terms of taking a real step back and, and even before we start research projects to ask what are the needs of communities and, and really involving you know, the Arctic from the very start. Um, so I'm pleased to see that there are definitely papers focused on that, um, and, but I think there is more to be done as well. Mm. But that also involves thinking about a lot of the new sort of emerging high-tech technologies. Um, is there any of the projects that, that also make use of 
local knowledge in terms of monitoring or looking at the needs of local communities? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of that, but uh, I guess that that could be... Uh, mm. well, especially environmental monitoring yeah, would be exactly. useful. Yeah. I mean, for if, I mean, one aspect that's been brought up, you know, is, is the food security. Mm. Um, maybe starting new aquaculture mm. in regions where it's mm. very much needed, mm. but at the same time that addresses issues with large-scale uh, environmental monitoring. Yeah, and then it's it's the maybe it's the um, the intent to start uh, a local food production that is more sustainable in a small scale, but taken up in a in a bigger scale, it's it becomes uh, more uh, problematic, uh, and I think that's something that local communities should be um, uh, maybe taking more control of uh, the local food production and uh, in their in the scale that they uh, that's needed. Mm -hmm. I think a good uh, another use case is harvest safety. So we're mm -hmm. building, we're using these technologies to build large platforms uh, to improve uh, air safety and air transportation. Because mm -hmm. in Canada, at least, we have 118 communities that are reliant on air transportation for most uh, of their resupply for the, the major part of the year. And uh, so we're building these AI and machine learning informed systems to better understand uh, weather patterns and. Uh, flight routing and scheduling. But are we taking into account applications like harvest safety? We have harvesters on the land moving across jurisdictions, you know, quite uh, broad spatial and temporal uh, activities. Mm. Um, and these applications could really improve safety. And the example that you gave also, like uh, search and rescue, you know, in, in contexts like Alaska, Canada, Greenland, where the space is so large, we are hours to respond. So that's probably the case in Northern Europe and Russia for sure. We are hours to our response times. So these applications could have benefit um, in contexts such as that. And so we have to ensure that we don't just build them to support commercial aviation or commercial sea lift, that we build them with these other use cases in mind. And we can best do this by having the community members and uh, representative organization leaders, you know, design those cases for us. Hmm. Right now we're sitting in what I would consider, and we're all from more urban areas, where we're sitting in the urban Arctic, um, surrounded by really well-developed infrastructure, whereas other Arctic regions are lacking more basic infrastructure. Um, if you think as a scientist, I mean, from, from, the, from the background you're coming in, and also the sessions that you've been part of uh, building up now, how can we as a scientific community address some of these infrastructure gaps? Ingrid, you have some thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as, as researchers, we can often identify the gaps and we can see the consequences of that very clearly. So again, I come back to this point about uh, dissemination of research, of, of making that heard in, in different circles and different spheres. And I think this is one such sphere where research and, and policy can potentially come together, because as, as researchers, unfortunately, we can't always build the infrastructure, but if we can have any kind of influence, then then that's perhaps where, where the potential lies. The other thing is, if there is any kind of legacy left behind of infrastructure that might come as a result of that research, then of course, are there ways that that could benefit um, the communities that we might be working in or with? Mm. Mm. And also, if we think going from, you know, the from local Arctic to global Arctic, uh, when Arctic societies transform, and they're transforming not only because of climate change, but also because more and more businesses are moving into the Arctic region and there are, there are more plants. Um, are there adaption strategies or perhaps also te technological solutions that would lead to new economic opportunities or job creation? This was very much debated in the plenary sessions yesterday and not so many good political answers, I would say. But, um, but what do we see in our research? Is there, is there a focus on that? Is there a focus on job creations and opportunities? 
I could definitely speak mm -hmm. to yeah. one, just one part, just one part uh, of our session, but there was actually very interesting research presented on um, on case study from Russia, where it was exactly surveyed what makes people move to a particular region and what makes them stay. So I think this is um, one of the very interesting examples that we uh, that we'll have and that we should hear more of. It's exactly people's incentives to move to the region to to stay there um, and exactly what what just drives people in in their decisions. Because I think oftentimes if we skip this part, even with the best intentions, without understanding those needs, those can be exactly well policy responses that would not be adequate to what people are looking for. So so definitely I could at least mention this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe to add as well that this is where the potential of those um, kind of cross-border conversations and so on come in really, really useful in, in the sense that we can learn from experiences in one place and see what works, what perhaps works less. Um, how do communities adapt? What sort of new opportunities might have worked well in one setting? Um, so just to take one example from the, the Barnes region where my own research is, is focused um, uh, in terms of the uh, end of, of mining. So in Hirkinas, there are experiences of, of mines having shut and now with nickel just on the other side of the border where the, the mines there are shutting are now learning from, from Hirkinas potentially um, as part of the, that Barnes cooperation. So I think, you know, again, the different levels that we are discussing at, learning from across the circuit in Poland North definitely has its advantages as well in this place. Knowledge sharing, yeah? Oh, sorry, just to speak kind of to a combination of that and, the, and your former question about infrastructure, you know, I, I like to speak positively about the, the resilience and capacity of the Arctic, but the state of Arctic infrastructure is of great concern to me and many of my colleagues, and I think climate impacts on that infrastructure are going to be, you know, uh, just devastating in the decades to come. And so I would love to see it if, if some of the work presented in your session, Hans, um, or in future uh, conferences is really addressing, you know, mitigating harmful impacts to that infrastructure and strategies that we can put in place um, to build sustainable communities or, you know, we, we don't even have in Canada the, the access to uh, bring equipment up to stabilize uh, what is happening to Arctic infrastructure, let alone to rebuild and kind of put in place the housing and buildings and services we need to make these communities safe and affordable for people. And a good example was last year, I don't know how many, how widely this news story um, reached the global media, but there was a fire at the grocery store, the main grocery store in Iqaluit, you know, with thousands of people dependent on this, largely this one site for their food. And you could hear when people on the street were interviewed the existential fear for how they would supply their families. And this was in Canada's only city in the Arctic. So smaller places are even more vulnerable to impacts like that. So, you know, I really think this is a priority for all of us as scientists and, and uh, people working in other organizations going forward, is addressing the, the risks to Arctic infrastructure. Mm. Mm. Alexa is taking notes for next year's science session. <laughs> um, there was one thing, our, our time is, is running out now for this little oral warm-up for the, for the science uh, to come. Uh, but there was one thing we all agreed on in the back room before we came up here today. And that was one subject that has been very badly addressed. And that is, um, in most of the plenary sessions, but, but not so clear in, in the sessions also. And what is lacking is the focus on women and gender issues in all our research. Uh, I think that's, I don't know if you want to comment on it, or we should just leave it hanging a little bit sort of in the air. But um, one good statement last yesterday came from the audience, a young woman really addressing what are the needs mm -hmm. for women with Sigrid? <laughs> what are the needs for women to, to, to stay on in the Arctic? What are the incentives? Um, and what are we doing with it? Yes. Thank you, Kiki, very much for bringing this question. And it's true, I think it is fair we've heard about this over discussion. Uh, but in a sense, it was mostly it was mostly coming well to the to people who were coming in the who were speaking as panelists here, right? And of course, well, the question of even participation is one aspect of it, and it and it's great that that it was brought in questions and so on. Um, but I think 
It is true. This is certainly a huge area to be, to be addressed, and it's a question also of gender when it comes to our research and understanding of the Arctic, of gender equality um, and of gender-based analysis. And I'm saying this for a reason. So. It's actually now under the Icelandic chairmanship of the Arctic Council, there is the um, third round of the project of gender equality in the Arctic, where among others, we'll be looking at, for instance, questions related to gender and climate change and gender and management of natural resources. And um, the reason why we are pointing this that um, even though it seems to be so often overlooked, and yet when we, what we intuitively know is that, and of course we can be speaking of people of many genders, but typically, if we say about, speak about men and women, people relate to, men and women relate to environment differently. They are differently affected by climate, climate change. Their respective responses and adaptation ideas and strategies might differ. And when we are skipping this part completely, I think we are, well, it's not only we are skipping huge part of research, but yesterday we had two great sessions about resilience communities. There are fascinating projects on resilience moving forward, but it's hard to speak about about enhancing resilience of communities without completely skipping the, this aspect. So I think if um, if Alexei is taking notes, um, I would say yeah, for the next uh, for the future, that could be definitely a huge area that would be worth covering here. Mm. Yeah. I think we can all agree on that and move forward with that. And our time is up. But thank you very much for some insights and some oral uh, good highlights on what we can expect over the next uh, days. It's a lot of interesting science and uh, I'll be seeing you again tomorrow for the science plenary. Thank you very much for taking the time and representing the research themes for Arctic Frontiers 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you.